um, uh, myself and Linda Hugdo from Legal Services will do some introductory stuff. Um, then Nancy Verstieg actually had to leave. She's from William Mitchell College of Law. Um, and then the Department of Human Services will be testifying and I believe a couple other very really short pieces. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm Liz Richards. I'm with the Minnesota uh, Coalition for Battered Women. The Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women has over 90 programs located throughout the state that serve battered women and their families. And indeed, we are testifying in opposition to this bill. And the reason why we are testifying in opposition is because we believe that it creates harm. And it creates harm in a number of ways. I'm just going to briefly go through those. Um, and people who follow me will be finding more of the details. Joint custody is not best for all children. And when joint custody is chosen by parents, it can be very beneficial. And under our current system, we have joint, a presumption of joint legal custody already on the books. We also have a system that allows parents to come in and do parenting plans. We have a system that allows for joint custody. Them, and it can be very beneficial. What research has shown is, is that when joint custody is not chosen, but rather is imposed upon parties, that that is when it can have detrimental impacts on children um, in terms of their ability to adjust to the divorce and the problems that go on ongoing. We also know that joint custody is particularly bad when domestic violence is present in the family. That um, we know that battered women continue to experience abuse even after they leave a relationship, even after a divorce. And joint custody arrangements increase the level of contact between the parents and exposes battered mothers to the potential for ongoing threats and abuse. One example, this is a study done in uh, Canada where 25% of the mothers who are using safety exchange centers experience direct threats of abuse. The abuse goes on long after divorces end. So in cases where there's domestic violence, there's increased potentials of risk. And when you go into a joint custody situation, you're increasing the level of contact between the parents and also those harms as well. The other thing we know is, is that joint custody legislation does not decrease conflict. That, um, now while there are few empirical studies looking at this issue, there are some. And what those studies are saying is, is that it doesn't have a at best, it has no impact on the amount of litigation that goes on, and that it may actually increase the amount of litigation when we move towards joint custody statutes. And I believe we're going to talk more directly about that. In considering any changes to the custody laws, you must consider the impact that those law changes are going to have on battered women and their children. And we know that battered and child abuse are present in a significant number of divorce cases. And we know that the cases that are the most drawn out, the most contentious, those that are often referred to as high conflict cases, we know that in those cases there's a significant percentage of domestic violence present. And one of the things, I think there's a little confusion in terms of how this bill is presented. In my read of this bill, you've taken out some of the specific factors to be looked at when looking at joint custody. Um, in terms of, there's a removal of the statutory factors that currently exist in our custody law that say the court is to consider the party's ability to communicate, what is their dispute resolution mechanisms, and to look at domestic abuse. And that's in the joint um, legal custody for factors. To remove those things from the statute um, is very dangerous. Custody and parenting time planning should treat security of the children as a top guiding principle. This is not about access. This is not about mom's right to have access to her kids. It's not about dad's right to have access to the kids. What this should be about is what is truly in the best interest of children. What is best for this family should be guided by what is best for the children. When domestic abuse is present in a family, what we know is that a child's sense of security is a critical factor in the resiliency to be able to overcome domestic violence. A whole body of research has been done here in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, Jeff Ellison being the primary researcher, showing that the resiliency of children is directly linked to the safety of their mothers, and it should be considered when making these decisions in the court. Now, I know that everyone on this, this uh, committee has heard the individual stories of people who have gone through divorce processes. These are powerful stories. We have all heard the stories of horrible divorces dragged out over long periods of time, taking incredible amounts of money, 
one parent not being able to see their children. We at the Coalition for Bad Women have heard those stories as well. We've heard them countless times. There are a number of women here who are, uh, today who would love to tell the committee their stories. It's a story of having been battered in a relationship, having gotten the courage to leave that relationship, only to find themselves having to be embroiled with the abuse of ex-husband in custody battles. And that oftentimes, that the children end up becoming a tool of continued abuse. It's a story of abusive fathers who too often gain custody of their children and exclude mothers from their children's lives. While the statistics may well show that mothers gain custody more often than fathers, what the statistics show is that when fathers request custody, they're more likely to, to gain custody, and that abusive fathers request custody more frequently than non-abusive fathers, and that when abusive fathers ask for custody, they are more likely to get sole or joint custody of those children than others. So it's important to look at what the statistics really say. And too often when abusive fathers gain custody, the abuse gets turned on to the children. Now, while these individual stories, the stories of fathers and the stories of battered mothers are very compelling, they are not the basis to make a change in the joint custody presumption statute. Hopefully what these stories are is they indicate we have a family court system that has enormous problems. Our current system is not doing a good job for families. So the, but the solution is not to adopt a joint custody presumption. What MCBW would propose is that we take a step back, that we take a comprehensive look at our family court system, we identify and understand the problems that are there, that we look at empirical data, we look at alternative <coughs> models that, we, that are being used around the country. We need to find solutions that are adequate and appropriately address all the problems in family court. So we would ask you not to pass House File 1262. The joint custody presumption will only add to the problems that already exist within the family court system. We need a more creative and thoughtful approach for comprehensive reform. Um, Ms. Huckel, it's my understanding that the 